You're listening to All About Girls of Color podcast, a space dedicated to creating environments that allow girls to thrive. We explore issues and solutions that focus on removing obstacles so the natural joy and genius of girls can bloom. Join us as we dive into conversations all about girls of color and the women they become. I'm Tanisa Cunright, the founder and executive director of Detour Empowers and the Fancy Teen Girls Leadership Academy. I'm Gabriela Delgado, an educator and principal consultant for Saving Our Starfish. And I'm Ginedra Sykes, an equity, diversity, and inclusion certified organizational development coach and consultant and a partner in our Beretta Group. Disclaimer. Our intention is to bring our whole selves to the conversations by bringing our professional and personal selves to each episode. Any views or opinions on the podcast are personal and belong solely to the creators and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the creators may or may not have been associated with in a professional or personal capacity unless explicitly stated. Welcome back to another episode of All About Girls of Color. I'm Gabby Delgado with Saving Our Starfish. I'm Tanisa Conright with Detour and Powers. I'm Janetra Sykes with our Beretta Group. So we're in for a special treat. We've got two guests with us today. So we're excited to have them share their expertise and inspire us to keep doing good work that um, can impact girls and women of color directly in our amazing state of California. So we've got Kimberly Bay and Tiffany Bartow here. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Janedra because I know she's made a, a direct connection with the two of you. So I just want to officially welcome you. And Janedra, why don't you get us Yeah, going? yeah. I am like, first of all, we just have to thank the thank you, the commission for funding us um, <laughs> for season one. I mean, we've had a wonderful um, trip together. We have spoken to women of color, um, primarily in California and a little bit nationwide and help amplify their voices and um, really talked about some really some important issues. And we're getting great feedback mm -hmm. that th this podcast is really resonating with with a lot of folks. So today we're so glad that the California Commission on the Status of Women that you're here to share with us your vision for women of girls in California. And what do you think are the primary issues that are facing women of women and girls, and primarily women and girls of color? And any call to action that you may have going forward for our audience. But first, I'd like to get to know you a bit better. If you could tell us a little bit about yourself, what your role is on the commission, and primarily what drew you to this work. Well, I guess I can go first. Tiffany Bartow, I'm Deputy Director of Operations and Grants at the commission. And I have been here about two years. Um, I started out as the program director, and then I took a promotion as the deputy director of operations. I have been in state service for a very long time. I'm very happy to be at this smaller commission. I have been at other agencies very large, so this is great to have a little bit more personal, intimate relationships with all of you all. I have grantees and also the team that we work with, which is very small. Um, and that's a little bit about me. I can throw this over to Kim. Thank you, Tiffany. So thank you. Um for having us, really happy to be here. I have not been with the commission that long. Um, I would say about six months, not even six months, I think. Tiffany helped me out. I think it was like the end of September. <laughs> it all it all blends together after a while. Um, and uh, just like Tiffany, I've worked for state service for a while and again, larger departments. And so um, making the move to the commission was a good move, uh, one, because of the the size of it, but two, because of the focus on bringing women and girls needs and issues to attention statewide. I mean, the California has the largest um, population of women and girls in the country, so, um, and a diverse population at that. So that's, you know, one of the main reasons I, I came to the commission. What draws you to the work? I think for me, it's the equality. I think there's always going to be an issue with us and being in a space to be equal. So for me, I'm about equal and fairness, right? Sometimes they're not measured the same. Is it equal? Is it fair? I think we need to be very clear what's happening with equality. And I think we've made some strides, but we're not there yet at all. And so I really want to make a way for other girls. I didn't think I had those same advantages as a young person as I am now to say, here's how, where you need to be assertive. 
this is where you think you need to, to fall back some. And so for me, it's definitely about equality and access. Does everyone have the same rights to access as other people? No. Women and girls definitely don't. And then it's even worse for women of color. So as a, being a woman of color, I definitely from firsthand know that we don't have the same access to everybody. We don't have the same materials or, you know, things are a little clicked up or in groups where we're not privy to. And so that's the problem. And it continues to be a problem as people try to pry open the door to see what's happening. I think it's not open wide enough. And so I think for me, those are the two things that I really, for this commission coming on, was like, how can I make a difference to make things be very equal for everybody? All on a lens where we mandate equal pay. But I think there's a lot of other aspects of equality I think we need to look into. And I think we do a great job here at this commission, but we need partnerships. And we need to really take a look at what's happening um, seriously, right? Some people, we sugarcoat some things. We shouldn't be that way. We need to tell it all how it is. Um, and we know that access has always been a problem. I think it will continue to be unless we make great strides with other partners to make sure things are accessible um, and equal. So that's what draws me to this commission. I should have gone first. I don't want to follow that, Tiffany. Um, <laughs> so I think this is a, I'm going to try to make this short, but so it draws me to the work. So when I think about just my life experience and um, how I grew up, the the career path I chose, how I've evolved as a person, I think that all of those things add up to where I am right now. And I know where I am. I'm supposed to be where I am. So um, what draws me to the work is like, I think about all the different it's it can get a little overwhelming to think about all of the different needs of women and girls right now. I it's very overwhelming. Admittedly, I was over even overwhelmed even like 10 minutes before this call, to be honest with you. I'm just thinking about all these <laughs> issues. And I think like my early experience, um, so I'm from Minnesota. And so my early experience working in Minneapolis with um, women, primarily women of color and um, young girls of color and um, working directly with the community and um, people who need services, then being on the other side of that and needing services myself um, when my kids were very little and then kind of coming up through the state, working um, in my previous job with, with youth uh, in under in underserved communities um, and seeing the the opportunities of just opportunities that they that were there but they didn't know about. I think that's kind of what I'm trying to say. I'm not being very articulate, but um, people there's opportunities there that are not being picked up. Yes, yes, and not being and not being uh, communicated with them. Um, just thinking, you know, um, you know, there's only one path, you know, I'm going to graduate high school and that's it for me. I'm going to get a job or I'm going to, you know, so when I think about like the work that we do at the commission, so women and girls, there's so many different, there's so many different opportunities to engage with. Yes, the policy side and the uh, politicians and that sort of thing, but also um, my, my actual passion and favorite part of it is engaging with community like uh, grantees, <laughs> uh, community members and youth. Um, and so when I think about what draws me, it's really just conversations, educating people. And in those conversations, um, that's where I think we make a difference. And, you know, one thing we've noticed, we, we saw a couple trends with the folks who have joined us this season thus far, and we always try to ask a little bit around the why. We're going to get to the work on policy and health equity and trauma and all these heavy topics that we were covering. And one thing we found is that the guests were always anchored in their why as to what kept them going and motivated to continue to lift this work that can be very challenging and daunting and overwhelming, as you expressed. So I appreciate you sharing a little bit about that why for you. Uh, for us, it's, I think we, and I don't want to speak for the two of you, but similar in that we take our experiences and we wanted to bring our whole selves to this project to say, we need to continue to create platforms to educate people because sometimes we take it for granted. Like we say, well, the resource is there. They didn't know to access. That's on them. Well, or maybe it's on the system 
that doesn't do a good enough job to remove the barriers to access. So you have a wonderful platform and people are are interested in learning what you have to say. So I'm curious, what are those topics? You alluded to a few of them earlier, Tiffany, but what are the ones right now that are the most pressing that we would want folks to really begin to to look at and dive deeper? What what are those critical issues for women and girls in California that that we want to begin to to focus on, begin to chip away? What would you say those are? Well, I could give you a whole list, right? I don't know how much time you have. I can I have a whole list, right? So this doesn't become a podcast; it's a movie. So I will <laughs> say that I think for me, and, and it's just, just being in, in this environment and um, working with all of you grantees and hearing all kinds of aspects of things that are happening in different communities. I think for me, what's a, a big issue, um, and it will continue to be, is women in sport, right? Why we have some inequality with women in sport. Um, that's always lingering. And Simone Biles, wonderful, um, gave her, you know, I have some mental health issues and I'm going to have to fall back. And people weren't okay with that. We want to see rock and shine and keep moving. I can't rock and shine and keep moving. I do need to stop and take a break, right? And people not really understanding where that comes from. There's a lot on that with women in sport. That's one. I will say period poverty. Um, this is a really big deal. I think personally, if I go into a CVS and need to get, you know, feminine products, why are they locked up? That yeah. shouldn't be something that's locked up. It shouldn't be something that's put back in the store where it be, it's like sneaky to go get it. This is products that we need. You don't have condoms locked up. That's the first thing out in the front. So there's things for us that we need as women that should be available to us because it's a need. And I think uh, lots of communities struggle with that. This is, you know, an issue, you know, nationwide. This is not just here, but here we do have a lot of issues with period poverty. And, I, and the last one I will say um, that's just dear to me is maternal health. And, you know, black women will women be able to you know, keep their babies, get pregnant and have their babies and be fruitful in that life. It's very difficult. And there's not real avenues for that. It's sometimes really shut down in the, in the health system on what your next steps are if you're not able to become a parent. And so there are many barriers for that. But I think those are some, for me, I would say some three very serious focus areas um, that really need some, some, some attention. You know, and, and I would like to add one to your list. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm, I'm, list. I'm that person. All right. Because what you shared earlier about the issue of equity and fairness, mm-hmm. right? You know, I and, I and I've been thinking about this often, like Governor Newsom in California just signed this law that said you had to make pay transparent in an organization. And my first thought was I'm a former ED of a, faith-based non urban nonprofit. My first thought was, ooh, the nonprofit sector is going to resist that. Right? To like showing their salaries. Mm-hmm. Because in California, a lot of the nonprofits are white led. Mm-hmm. White female leadership with women of color doing frontline direct services work. I mean there's really a very clear hierarchy. Right. And so, you know, when we talk about equity and fairness, my hope is that we could begin that at home, among mm-hmm. women, among each other, to get fairness there. Can I add something to what you're saying right now? I really appreciate you bringing this up because I think we have to be in the space, all women need to be in the space to be able to see this and uplift each other. Yeah. So I appreciate you bringing this up because I do think um, there is something to be said as, you know, uh, Kim and I, Kim's my, my colleague in the workplace, and um, definitely helping lift her up. And what is it that you need? And what can I what can I bring? And really not seeing any threat in helping somebody else out. I think it's difficult for people being a space to let's be equal. They have to have a very weird, um, because sometimes this is inbred, right? Especially in state service, it's hierarchical and people forget where you come from. You forget that you were a secretary and you were an office assistant and you have to do the thing. You now have an assistant and you're like, oh, can you do that? So that's not fair. You can, you can still like make print copies. You don't have to have somebody else do that for you. So I think people need to be very much open minded in that space of not feeling threatened by other people and being okay to lift somebody else up. We need it more than anybody in this space as black women together to uplift because we all come from different backgrounds and some people may have been able to get somewhere easier than others. I think Kim mentioned as well as like we've, you know, moved up in this state, right? 
Yeah. I don't have a family member or a cousin or something that put, picked me up or this is how you do this. It's all let me learn how to do that. So my give back always for young people is let me show you how to get into a civil service appointment position. There's a, a pace that you have to take and take an exam. This is how you have to do this so you can get in. Make sure you qualify for everything. Paying that back to other people so they know how to be um, in that space of uplifting somebody else. And you hope the nuggets that you give someone else that they go, oh, this is how I was treated. I'm going to do that same thing. And that's where I come from. Is someone doing that to me? And I always have to be in that space of let me help uplift you because someone was able to do that to me. So, you know, equity and fairness sometimes is not always the same thing. And they're two, two completely different things. Um, but I think in that space that you're talking about right now about equity, that is us uplifting each other to have us be equal. We're not someone above or below. Um, you have to be in the space of that. We're coming at the same, we're coming to the table at the same time. Um, and always because of the color of our skin and being a female, we start 10 steps back. So you can't be with each other doing that. We have to be together in the same footprint to make sure we elevate each other to be equal. Or at least have fair pipelines that there's people, there's opportunities for those that want to move up can and the structures within organizations that allow that. Pathways. Funding is so important, right? So the grants that you've made available, and I will say as someone who, who does grants for a living for the job that pays the mortgage, is the process you made it doable for people, and that is not often the case for a lot of grantors. And sometimes people are overwhelmed in smaller nonprofits to say, they're asking for this massive evaluation component. I have to have an external, you know this, yeah. you've lived this. Yeah. And so I will just say, <clears throat> you've removed certain barriers that we know exist when certain funders do not have women of color at their, the center of their interest. And so when you remove that barrier for the multiple grantees that you funded, you're contributing to that work, right? To say, we want you to be able to focus on these specific areas because you've identified the need, but then also making it actually practical for people to do the work. When we offer support financially, but then say, I'm going to make you jump through 15 different hoops, you lose people. And you say, look, we're, we're hustling here. We're trying to make a difference and an impact in our community. And then still make sure that the bills get paid, yeah. right? But it's because we, that's our why to the work. And so I really appreciate that from the recipient end, that it's you actually made it practical and doable so that people could get on their business, just do the work, focus mm -hmm. on the work that matters, and not that you're not holding us accountable and you know there's reports and all that that we submit to you quarterly and all of that. <laughs> <laughs> but I will just tell you, as someone who's done grants for a long time, the process was very refreshing and one that I wish our philanthropic partners throughout this country would consider to say, you can't tease people with this idea of we're going to give you all these you know great dollars and funding streams. And then you kind of jack up the process along the way that becomes hurtful and harmful. And then you lose really quality, good programming mm -hmm. and ideas because people just can't lift the work when it becomes overwhelming. So I'm sure there was a lot of thought that, that went into developing a model that works. but from three women who work hard, you know, work boots on the ground, that made a huge difference to be mm -hmm. able to do a project like this. So I'm very appreciative of, of what you've been able to do. And it just speaks to that, that you're removing barriers, even in the systems that you're developing. And that's what we're hoping people can do is go back, reflect on your own system and your organization. Mm -hmm. Do you have a mentoring program for incoming? What does the onboarding look like? Can we provide um, you know, a young woman coming in with a particular coach, can, 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 we, can we have that be a, a model that we implement? So encouraging folks to look uh, for sustainable practices within their organizations that can really have that, that long-term long -term impact. Yeah. And then I also like to add, you allowed us to remain authentic, mm -hmm. which is very difficult in the nonprofit space when oh, you're yes, running Lord. an organization. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're running an organization and the the grants come out and you're needing the resources, but not really fitting into those categories. Um, a colleague of mine calls it a purple apple, you know, <laughs> going into the grocery store and looking for a purple apple. And then what do all the apples do? They try to become a purple apple because they mm -hmm. want to get selected, you know, and it causes mission drift. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And so, um, and, and it takes away from the work at core because then now we're spread so thin because we're trying to qualify for everything. Uh, so that's something that I really appreciated as a um, nonprofit leader is that you all are allowing us to remain our authentic selves and allowing us to bring that to the table and see what comes from, you know, all of us just doing great work together. Right. Well, you guys, congratulations, because you are doing amazing work. And by no means did we want anyone to have to jump through hoops, but we did absolutely what we're supposed to do, legal-wise. Throw that out there for <laughs> We did what we were supposed to do legal-wise, but we definitely made this be, you know, an opportunity for everybody to be authentic in this space and make a huge impact. And so we are very grateful to all of our grantees for all of the work that they're doing. Um, the example when you're saying with the property, like that's really what we're looking at. What kind of impact are you making? And that's what we would like for you to tell your story. You know, when you're applying for a grant, is what are you doing on the ground? How do you think you can make an impact? How are you measuring that? So that success story is not only for you as for us to tell the story to the state of California, what we've done for women and girls. Um, so making an impact for me with this commission is really, really, really good. This is why we say, can we come visit? Let me come see you do some work in action because I really want to be there in the moment to be like, wow, look at what you've done with, with this dollars. So I definitely agree with us trying to make it be easy and manageable. I can't speak for anybody else, but the commission definitely wants this to be manageable for people to take advantage of, spread the word, let us know that we're how we can be a really good partner to you all because we want this to be sustainable. This is not just we give you grant funding, give us, you know, what you've been doing in your activities and we're done. Continue to partner with us. Let us know the work that you guys have. You're doing out here. Can we come visit? Can we help in any way? Because we also need to amplify spots where we do see gaps. You know, there's some gaps in certain areas that people aren't able to reach, you know, throughout the state of California, these rural areas that people aren't able to reach. How can we reach those areas? And how can we make an impact in those areas? So, you know, that's helpful for our local commissions, but it's also for good for nonprofit organizations who can reach out to those areas that we just don't know um, have any issues. But we know that the California is huge and there are areas that are not being touched. So thank you for the work that you guys are doing to keep this work alive. So have you noticed any themes that kind of surfaced for women and girls of color as you guys look across the state? You know, my, my first thought, and this is the drum that I beat, are resources. You know, there's, there's a difference between resources being available and resources that you feel you have access to. You know, I mean, th those are like two different things. You know, um, I just remember one time being stunned at, now this is not the state, but this is the philanthropic foundation community, that it was single digits of the major foundations that gave money to black, indigenous, people of color-led organizations. It was like 3% or 4%. So in theory, the money's there, but how many times can we have the no? Well, you know, you're right. In theory, the money is there, but how are we messaging it and marketing it so everybody yeah. knows that it exists, right? So there's not like a hub, you know, of a location where you can go to and go, well, let me run through here and see, like, see if I fit for this. Because you made a really good point that even if you do, there's going to be a hurdle when you get in the middle of it. Like, yeah. how, how am I supposed to meet this? Because then maybe I just shouldn't apply. So there needs to be a much easier way to find out what those resources are and how, you know, early in the game that you can benefit from them besides you get happy and in the process and then you have a stop sign because then you are discouraged and you won't want to finish that through. So, you know, again, I like that you're talking about the access and resources because they are two complete different things that we cannot seem to manage why it's not getting out to the people who really need it the most. So we need to widen that net on our resources for sure to make sure that people who need it can take advantage of these benefits that we have because they're there. It's just like college, kids are ready to go to college. I don't have a list of schools that offer this financial aid. How come I don't know that this is available? And if it's something specific that's going to hit my, you know, minority child, how come I don't know about that? How come there isn't something that's specific that I know that I should go out to? And I think it's not helpful sometimes if you give it to your, your kiddo at school because it's like, I have a stack of papers. Here you go, right? You're going to lose all that stuff. There needs to be available, um, accessible resources so that everybody can take advantage of whatever the resource may be. And it's also having women advocates that have a connection to those communities who also have lived experience who then bring that perspective. So you, don't, you can't have divergent thinking if it's the same type of person 
in every boardroom, right? Yes. And so that's the problem, right? So you think, right, it's not going to change unless we, the community that we're wanting to serve, is really at that table. And so you're two women representing large communities of women of color. Do you ever feel a sense of weight in your in your particular roles now in having to, to promote that sense of advocacy? And what is that for you as a woman of color in the role that you currently have um, to continue to to kind of beat down some doors that need to be pushed through? Are you what, tired? Are you, yeah. Are you tired? That's what she's saying. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Are you tired? What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what she's trying to ask. Right? What are you trying to say? Can you yeah. I think any position I'm in, I feel a sense of weight. I mean, whether it's a uh, program director for the commission, mother of two black boys, um, you know, uh, I, I, I just think that for me, I have to be careful. And I'm, I, I'm very grateful to have Tiffany as a colleague. I just have to say that. I have to be very careful, like, to not take like yes the work is personal to me but I can't take things personally like because I have a tendency to be an overthinker take things personally (laughs) and I have to remember who I am but also remember to um, continue to to approach things professionally also bringing my experience life experience education work experience but so I think when I think about all these things it is very exhausting and it's not just like oh I'm showing up to work and let's just you know check the boxes and do all the things like it's 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 a lot to think about and to track if that makes sense I um I don't know if I make any sense but um it's a lot like I'm tired a lot of the times and I and it's not just like It's not just like, oh, I'm tired. I had a long day. It's I'm tired because I'm mentally exhausted from thinking of all these things. And because it, as as you all know, like when you are working on something that you are passionate about and you know it's going to have an effect on people, especially young people who are going to be grown women one day, right? Um, You're watching. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that goes into that. And so like, for instance, we are in the process of forming a youth, the first uh, youth advisory council for the commission. And um, so we're in the process of forming it. You know, I had this plan. I'm very type A, like I have a plan, I'm writing it down. I'm, you know, they're going to do all these things. And then we get all these uh, one, one application after another, after another. And and as I'm reading these applications and seeing all of these remarkable young people who are very insightful um, about life in general and, and the issues that affect them, uh, one thing leads to another. I'm like, oh, we can do this and we can do this and we can do this. And, we can, and I'm just like, and I'm thinking of all these things, but there's only 24 hours in a day and um, only certain uh, days in a week. So I think that. Uh, to answer your question, it is a heavy, it's heavy work. <laughs> um, it's worth it, but it's heavy. Yes. I appreciate you being honest because sometimes we don't talk about the cost of the, yeah. of the career and passions we have. And we just think, oh, they're so successful. And, you know, they're, you know, have big titles that match their big education. It's all wonderful, but, but there's, weight that that comes with yeah. right of the responsibility um and almost feeling like a sense of obligation like there's people like you said they're watching and I don't want to I don't want to screw it up for someone else and so I appreciate you voicing that and being genuine in that because sometimes I've been in spaces with professional women and I think yeah you may look like you have it all together and you're holding all together for this two-hour meeting but <laughs> I wonder what that really looks like. You get that one glance across yeah. the room. You're like, like no, yeah, yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. Are you, you, you see what I see? Right? <laughs> I just appreciate the authenticity. I yeah. get re, I yeah. get re-energized when I'm with Jen Nedra and Tanisa because I can just 
I feel like I can let that armor go a little bit and just say, okay, I can be real and tell you how I really felt about something that really ticked me off at this other place of employment or, or did it, and, you know, right before we got on the call, like, why aren't, why aren't they taking advantage of this great programming that Tidys is offering? And so we want to create that environment for people to say, look, people, we are still trying to figure out our own journeys. Yeah. But part of it is even as adult women, moms and um, wives and partners, we still need circles for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, in my work with young people, I'm like, yeah, they think we have it all figured out. I'm like, then, no, uh, no, 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 not all. Not is all it ever all figured yeah. out? Yeah. No, no. So I just I appreciate that from, yeah. from both of you because yeah. it's important that we keep that connection going and that especially women that are entering the workforce to know you, you have to strive for that work-life balance because let me tell you, yeah you're going to burn the candle at both ends mm -hmm. and that comes at a cost, especially in, in service oriented um, professions as, as, as you well know. So um, I appreciate your, your, um, your authenticity with that. It's not easy to talk about that. So it's, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. That kind of brings me back to when we first started the, the collective, when we did an mm -hmm. assessment, you know, like there were 70 women in the room. <laughs> We were, you know, the, I facilitated this meeting and we were talking about, you know, what do girls of color need? And a profound wisdom came out of the group, which was, we need a place for us mm -hmm. to yeah. recharge, you know, and support each other because we can't give what we don't have, you know? And it makes me think about, I don't know, I'm going to jack up the, the actual quote, but there's a famous quote from Audre Lorde that says something like self-care is a political act. And what a revolutionary political act, I think the word revolutionary, because I, I kind of sat with that thinking about like, as women of color, we're socialized to give, 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 but we need that balance to receive, 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 receive. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we just have to demand that space. Oh, yeah. I, Kim and I went to a conference, the Alliance for Girls conference, and I think they had a slide up that said the revolution is female, right? And we're like, let's take this picture because this is real talk, right? This is, this is great. Um, and so when you say that, that makes me think of, I don't know that, I have, I have a daughter, my daughter's a sixth grader. And so I don't know that we as Black women ever have been in that space or been taught, not everybody, but have been taught what that's like to be able to open and receive because you are, you know, giving, 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 giving. So it's hard to like stop me like, what can I receive? Is there any like time out and check out time for me? And for young people, they need it now more than ever. I think Kim and I talked about, we didn't have these things. We didn't have cell phones. I think Kim and I were like, we had a pager. And then how did you, how did you go call somebody, right? You had a pager. You had to put codes in there. And the pay phone. You had to have yes. Yeah, you had to like code it to, to tell people. So like, I'll call you back. And it was like six, seven, nine, whatever. Right. We, we didn't have, you know, a phone to just go do anything. So now for young people, it's just much easier to be what I call an, an emotional bully, right? And you're a young girl being this emotional bully, you become a grown woman who's the same way. And you can't function amongst other women. You have no idea that where to start because you haven't learned that as a child. Mm -hmm. So as black women, as little kids, like learning what that's like to like, it's always like give and take. It is not about you take, 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 take. And it's also not about all the weight being on you. And I think systemically, that's how this has been for us is all the weight is on us. And so how to how to let some of that go is very difficult for us because you're right. We want to be like, I got this, right? I'm standing tall. But always, and my mom told me this, um, as maybe in my early 20s, to say everything that glitters is not gold because some people still have wet pillows at night. And I had no clue what she meant by that. And now, now as a grown up, I'm telling my daughter the same thing. You have these girls here doing the thing and they're bigger and badder and this, but they're crying at night because they have some issues that they're struggling with, but you have to show the space all day, every day. Is that hard to show the face all day, every day, as opposed to just be you? Yeah, you're, you're falling apart like everybody else is. And it's no different what everybody else's struggle is if you let that be known. So it's hard, I think, to get the help that you need if you have these barriers up and you don't want to let anybody in or you just really don't know how. So for young people, it's hard to know what that looks like you like on the how part. So um, I'm hearing you. I, I'm hearing yeah, and, you. And this is a thing. I just recently learned this, that folks have done research on this. It's called the Sojourner Syndrome. And mm -hmm. it's about excessively caring black 
you know, and I'm sure there's a Latina version of that. Sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> what you call it? Maria Santa Carmen or something. <laughs> Send that to me. Send that to me. Yeah, yeah. And then we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. I mean, when I realized that's research on it, I'm talking peer review papers on it. I'm like, what? Right. Yeah. People are studying that, that, you know, what it does to our immune system, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's wild. And I think that's what leads to black women starting their own businesses at the mm-hmm. rate in which they are, because you can't really find yourself in corporate, you know, you're taking care of everybody at home. So you end up creating this third space of like your passion project. You know, in order to allow that piece of you to really get life and breath and breathe, mm-hmm. yeah, because it fulfills you in some way, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have more control, yeah. right? I'm mm-hmm. in the control. You have control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's another area that we've seen that's come up quite a bit, and there's been some research released in the last couple of weeks around the overall mental health of girls and women of color, and you're starting to see a um, you mentioned having a sixth grade daughter, and so I'm sure that is on your mind because we are seeing that, unfortunately, they are expressing overwhelming sadness for a sustained period of time, and that wasn't the case. I mean, it was present before COVID, and now it's just um, much more magnified. And so, you know, again, looking for strategies and, and supports to be able to offer to say, how do we, how do we best help young people? But then it also for us goes back to, but but the women in their lives have to be right because oftentimes if they're not, they, they don't have that. The young girl, girl won't have that support system that she desperately needs. And so it goes back to that point when we met with women in the community, they kept saying, we need that space for ourselves of just having an outlet and a space where it's you know uh, free of judgment. And I can be curious and have wonderings about things and not um, and just be myself. And so I think that's super important, especially when we're not getting that in in our full time workplaces, so if, if the community can offer that safe haven for uh, the adult women, then if we could turn around and, and encourage them to to mimic that with the young girls in their community, then then you have the cyclical uh, support system, which is ultimately what we're wanting to see. Um, yeah. It's all connected to that. We yeah. all spoke. We've all heard. You know, you all have yeah. maybe mentors in your life, and so we think we want to be able to keep that going. Uh, but then also have the systems and those structures lend themselves to create um, support versus harm. Yeah, I just remember my mentor having a conversation with my mentor once, and I was critical. I know it's hard to believe, but I was critical of this woman that was in public view that kind of had a professional meltdown in public. And I was really judgy. I was like, what happened to her? What's wrong with her? She just lost it. My mentor said, just stop me. No. Who's at fault there is her support system. Because her support system should have seen her cracking. Mm. Pulled her aside and said, girl, we got this. You sit down and take a nap and have a (laughs) snack. Yeah. You know, and regroup. And we got you. Until she could get herself back together, and I'll never forget forget that. And I just kind of, you know, a little ashamed of my heavy judgment there. But that conversation really changed me because you don't know what people are going through, especially women that are out front and really public facing jobs. What kind is her support system real, or is there kind of a level of exploitation there where there she's just pushed mm-hmm. out, and if she cracks, oh well. Mm-hmm you know, kind of next. Is that something that the commission, I know you're, you're continuing your, um, you know, your grant making strategies throughout the state. Is that, is there space for having women connect to our uh, grantees to say kind of like, is there anyone else out there kind of doing something similar that I could learn from? I'm just kind of thinking about that. Or as cracky as I am. Yeah, so there's a (laughs) So is that something, or have you seen that expressed? Um, yeah, in- you know, that's a really great question. Um, and, of course, thank you. We do have another um, grant running right now. So um, we do try to connect people with other organizations that may receive that 
maybe fit. I haven't had people really ask. I will say, touch base with people. Touch base with people to see how things are going. And if they need anything, if you have any program going that we can come visit. And they really will go expansive, you know, on this is the work that we're doing. And then I say, well, hey, I know another organization in your area. They also do something similar. You may want to contact Tanisha to find out about this program and see how you guys can connect. So I haven't necessarily had it where someone asked, but I do, um, and I have a brand new um, grants manager, um, and Kim also helps us with our, our grants as well, but we try to connect where we can, where people we see the work may be similar or they're in the same area. Mm-hmm. So um, that has been helpful to see that work. I haven't seen it unfold yet where like the programming maybe have connected, but I'm definitely looking forward to that. People have connected. So people do say, thank you for sending me her way because I was able to catch up with her. I may be here and they're in LA, but we're going to try to see how our events can coordinate. So, yeah, I'm thinking because sometimes, you know, we'll go to meetings and sometimes I think, oh my gosh, it's another meeting where they, they ask of me and they're wanting something from me. Okay. This is, this is a space where we collectively give and support one another, right? So I, I just think the more that we could do that in general would be great so that you can come to a meeting thinking, you're not just going to pick my brain take my idea and <laughs> say, oh, okay, no, you, yeah. we're actually here to lift and support one another. Yeah. Um, and it's mutual, right? As opposed to feeling like it, because sometimes, you know, I'll go to certain meetings and I think, oh no, you're, you're wanting me to lead this charge because you know, I'm a type A and I'm an executor, <laughs> but that gets tiring. Right. And so mm-hmm. just having that space, I think is, is super important. So um, yeah, for what it's worth, I mean, we love the connections. Yeah. Um, and I'm hearing, Nisa's voice. We know we're going to leverage that. <laughs> yeah. I'll send you a note later. I'll send you a note later. One that's not, we're not going to do that yeah. ourselves. If somebody <laughs> else is doing that. Right. And as we're the, so used to doing it all. Yeah. Gonna, and as the leader of a nonprofit organization, I am at capacity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I, you know, as a funder, that's always feedback that I give, like what are resources that we can share, you know, with other nonprofits that may have the same issues that we're having as far as, you know, capacity building, scaling what we do, things of that nature. So if you've ever had any feedback from other organizations about that type of stuff, um, that's also, you know, historically been a need for smaller nonprofits. Oh, yeah, no, definitely. And it, it's hard for you. I mean, we talk about capacity building. Um, we did see a lot of that in this last grant funding opportunity. A lot of people just, I need to build up my human capital. I don't have people to do the work. So it's difficult for people to be in volunteer spaces or a part-time ED or, you know, you have one, like, office technician. Well, that part-time. Right. You're right. supposed to stay like, part-time. I know. You're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it hits home. So I, I definitely like to make sure that People are connecting with each other because you can figure out what that looks like to build capacity. And especially if you're in close proximity, it may work out well to do some type of job share, right? That works out great for everybody. So um, I will say I'm very, I'm very grateful to the Legislative Women's Caucus for this, this funding, you know, five, up to $5 million is what we, we have. And it's been amazing. It's great to see this work unfold. It's great to talk to people and draw the connection with folks. It's like, hey, I'm doing this project on incarcerated women. Well, I'm also doing a project on incarcerated women and their children, and then also also foster youth. So oftentimes when women go to prison, their children will go into the system if they don't have family members to care for them. And so those kids, what happens to those kids? Who's caring for, for those kids? Let's draw the connection between the two so we can figure out what this will look like. Mm-hmm. So um, building that bridge with the, each organization is very different, um, but they do make a really huge impact, which is what we like to see. And we come here and, and tell the stories on how that all unfolded. Where do you see the commission in the next five to ten years? If you had a magic wand, you could wave your your your, your magic. Day. Yeah, your queen for today. I know you guys. Kim is laughing. She's going first. Ten years. Oh my gosh. <laughs> five well, to ten. Okay. Yeah. So in five to ten years, I don't want to be in existence because I would hope that by then, women don't need a women's commission. I mean, it's just like, it's, I mean, I always say this, like, and I think um, I've told Tiffany this before, like, we should not need human rights organizations, right? Just like we should not need women's organizations. I, I mean, because in a perfect world, I, they wouldn't need to exist because everything would be joy, joy and flowers and, you know, gumdrops, but that's not going to happen. So I'm being a realist. 
I think in 10 years, no, 10 years is too long. I'm going to do five years. <laughs> 10 years is too long. 10 years is making you tired, right? <laughs> I'm like, 10 years is too long. Five years. Wow. Well, I can only, okay. So I'm just going to speak to what I've been working on and kind of how I want to see that grow and develop. So my three main things that I, well, I, we all do a lot because we're such a small question, but my three main things have been um, working um, Equal Pay California with the First Partners Office and the California Partners Project. And so that and, um, you know, forming a youth advisory council and then also working and fostering relationships with dignitaries from um, other countries. And so, and sharing best practices and that sort of thing. So I think, you know, obviously everything, I would like to see those programs grow. And, you know, the equal pay, the equal pay pledge is uh, very important. And it's not just about equal pay, it's about gender equity in the workplace. So, you know, hiring and retaining a a diverse workforce, um, making sure that you're looking at making policies through um, an equ- equity lens. And there's just so many things that go into it, but really growing that program and having hundreds of signatories and helping them, supporting them. So like, as you all were talking about work with the the grantees, I in my, I was thinking of grantees, I was also thinking of businesses that sign, sign the pledge and, and uplifting the work. Um, and uplifting and sharing best practices. So I was kind of like making parallels in my mind, like grantees, best practices, signatories, best practices, because that's how my mind works. But um, so growing that program, I think having a youth advisory council that's robust and really making sure that everybody's voice has been included and representative of California, uh, both geographically and demographically, for the youth and really making an impact because that's that's the whole point is having them convene to inform our policy like what we support um, or what we sponsor for policies and really um, identifying the needs of the of the youth around California. Yeah, I think that's that's, that's <laughs> it. There's a lot. I, well, I will tell you that I will be quick with this. I don't know if we're, we're wrapping time up, but I will say, um, Kim does have a lot, right? This, this is heavy. So I, I, I too, um, so I think the programming for five years, I can't give you guys 10. I think the commission would be awesome to be fully staffed, right? We have 17 commissioners and eight staff. So that's like uneven in itself. So if we could have a lot more staff with this commission and the commission can stand alone, be a standalone state agency. There's a lot of agencies that are commissioned that are on their own. We are a client agency of the Department of General Services. And so a lot of that work, you know, we work through with DGS, which is great. We have a great partnership with them. Um, but I think it'd be great to see the commission really grow and do standalone. We have our own budget authority. We can do our own contracting, right? All that stuff is in-house with a large, full, robust organization and staff. The commission also works with STEAM, so engaging girls in theme, so getting girls in the right space that most of these fields are dominated by men. I will tell you that nobody asked me about the A. I would have said architecture, but it's art. And so uh, while I personally feel like artsy, you know, look at Kim. We have to give this up for Kim. She's she's in the art. Um, you know, architecture is really lacking for women, right? Engineers. And so really making that program be really robust so girls are no longer fighting for that seat. It's like those these these business adventures, if you will, if there's nothing you want to, you are welcome to do this. It's not like, can I shrinking Violet to the table? It's like, I know I can. And you're available and you're there, you're front and center. We also focus on, um, we are members of the State Advisory Committee on Sexual Assault. So that's working with thousands of organizations who work with domestic violence and sexual assault rape victims. And so making sure that those women and girls also have the access that they need for all kinds of services that surround domestic violence and sexual assault. So I, I, over the next five years, would definitely want to see some of that little bit cease, right? So the numbers aren't so high, that people are getting the resources that they need, the medical attention they need. Um, the court cases are up front being heard for the for these victims. So I'd really like to see a lot of this cease. Um, it's not going to be gone. We do know that, right? But some of it at much lower numbers than what we have seen. And I do know that COVID has drastically made things different all around. 
But I do think as we're coming out of it, we can make a little bit more significant strides than where we are. But I do understand that it does take time. So I'm looking forward to that five to 10 year plan unfold. I am tired and I definitely will not hopefully be working a day past 55, but we'll see how that comes. <laughs> so when we're doing our sixth season, you can come back and give us a full report on your five year magic <laughs> clean for a day and we can I will I will you guys let me know I'm gonna have a nice Harry Potter one too for you just so you know <laughs> <laughs> well we appreciate you taking the time we know you're extremely busy uh, we appreciate you taking the time I believe you are our second to last episode we might do a reflection episode mm -hmm. and wrap up the season but we just can't thank you enough for the support and just believing in these small projects that turn into big ideas that can really uh, support and leverage big impact. And, you know, we are big believers and in, in we're creating ripples uh, and we're harnessing all this strength that women bring to the table in our own respective communities. So we appreciate your time. We appreciate what you do. You continue to advocate for women and girls in California. So However, we can be stewards of that message as well. Please feel free to call on us. You don't have to, everything you're saying, I'm like, Yes, 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 we agree, we agree, and and we are happy to support you. So, uh, Janedra and Janisa, anything from the two of you before we wrap up? No, I think I'm yeah. good. Thank you. Thank yes. you, guys. Thank you so much for having both of us here. The commission is small, but we are very mighty. So I appreciate your guys' time today. Thank you so much. And take care of Thank yourself. you so much for joining Thank us. You. Yes. Thank you for having us. That does it for another episode of All About Girls of Color. I'm Gabby. I'm Tanisa. I'm Janetra. Catch you next time. This podcast is made possible by the California Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. Additional sponsors include San Diego County Employees Charitable Organization. You can access all episodes and connect with us via email at allaboutgirlsofcolor.com.